welcome tonight. In what looks like a U-turn, federal government sets up tactical committee to review its no-work, no-pay policy, which has been a stumbling block in its negotiations with ASU. Speaker of the Ogun State House of Assembly, Ola Kunle Oluomo, pleads not guilty to fraud allegations as Federal High Court in Lagos grants him bail. Ahead of the 2023 general elections, Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, reviews guidelines for voting in internally displaced persons' camp. And on business news tonight, Securities and Exchange Commission records 2.5 billion Naira profit surplus in six months after three years of steady decline. On sports news tonight, Dinamo Zagreb stuns two-time champions Chelsea 1-0 at the Stadion Meximir in match day one of the UEFA Champions League. And from Abuja, Nigeria, Poland signed Memorandum of Understanding to address food security as well as the supply of liquefied natural gas to the European Union. There may just be some light at the end of this tunnel. That is talking about the face-off between the federal government and striking university lecturers as the government today announced the setting up of a tactical committee to review the no-work, no-pay policy in what is seen as some form of concession by the government. This follows a meeting between the Minister of Education, Mr. Adamu Adamu, and pro-chancellors, chancellors as well as vice-chancellors of universities in Abuja. The minister, however, made it clear that the government can only afford a 23.5% increase for all categories of the workforce in federal universities and and 35% increment for the professional cadre. Our correspondent, Emperor Simon, reports. It's been six months and 21 days since lecturers in public universities embarked on an industrial action. And for this reason, the education minister, Mr. Adamu Adamu, is meeting pro-chancellors, chancellors and vice-chancellors of all the public universities in the country. <laughs> It's not the first time the federal government will be engaging in such an effort to resolve its lingering on pass with the members of the academic staff union of universities. And the fact that none of the meetings has yielded any success is given the Minister of Education some sleepless nights. For me, the past two weeks have been a very tough period of personal anguish and internal turmoil. I used to see myself that in a climate of frankness and with mutual goodwill, it will fall to my lot, bring an end to the incessant strikes in the education sector. This so far has not proved possible. He also discloses some of the offers that the federal government had made to the striking lecturers, including increasing their salaries. The package offered me centered around four positions agreed upon by the government, and these are the centers. Number one, that the federal government can only afford a 23.5 salary increase across the board for all category of the workforce in all federal universities, except for the professorial cadre, which will enjoy a 35% upward review. Number two, that henceforth allowances that pertain to ad hoc duties of the academic and non-academic staff should be paid as and when due by the governing councils of universities to which services were rendered and to the staff who performed them. Among other demands ASU is making of the federal government are funding for the revitalization of public universities and payment of earned academic allowances for which President Mohamed Buhari is said to have approved the sum of 150 billion naira to be provided in the 2023 budget as funds for revitalization of federal universities and 50 billion naira for the payment of outstanding arrears of earned academic allowances. 
But that would not make the lecturers renege on their decision to keep academic activities in public universities grounded as the union declared an indefinite strike on the 29th of August, while the federal government insisted on implementing its no-work, no-pay policy. However, at the end of the over two-hour closed-door meeting, the federal government seems to be making some adjustments in our earlier stand on the no-work, no-pay policy. The meeting constituted, constituted a committee made up of four pro-chancellors and five vice-chancellors to be chaired by the minister to further uh, look at the additional demands as he is uh, making. Two basic areas that this committee will be looking at, among other things, is the no work, no pay issue. Uh, the second is the issue of remunerations of uh, uh, university lecturers. We had very frank deliberations on all the issues, and I'm personally convinced, as the chairman of council of the National Open University of Nigeria, that the 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 uh, the, the dark clouds will soon clear. The committee is expected to submit its report to the government within two weeks from now. Emperor Simon, Channels Television News. Still on education, the Minister of State for Education, Mr. Goodluck Obhier, says 31% of Nigerians are non-literate. The minister, who was speaking in Abuja during an event to mark the 2022 International Literacy Day, says there's been a reduction in the number of persons who are unable to read or write in Nigeria from 38% as at 2015 to 31% this year. The United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO's Regional Advisor for Education, Albert Mendy, who was also at the event, spoke on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the educational sector. To improve literacy level in our country, we have a lot of success recorded some of which includes guaranteed additional access to adult and non-formal education programs in 377 centers across the 36 states and FCT. It is heartwarming to note that the current statistics of 2022, based on estimations, capture the non-literate population at about 31% of the estimated total population. This is a significant reduction from the hitherto statistics of 38% in the year 2015. 771 million young and adults around the world still do not possess these literacy skills. 60% of whom are girls and women. COVID-19 is exacerbating this issue. School closures and disruption causes caused by the pandemic have likely driven learning losses and dropouts. This is especially true for vulnerable populations. And now to the court. The Federal High Court sitting in Lagos has granted bail to the Speaker of the Ogun State House of Assembly, Olakunde Uluomo, in the sum of 300 million naira, with two sureties in like sum. Justice Daniel Osaigo granted bail following no objections from the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. The EFCC counsel, Rosemary Dipo, had told the court that he would leave the issue of bail solely within the discretion of the court, while counsel to the Speaker and Senior Advocate of Nigeria asked the court to admit his client to bail on liberal terms. Our judiciary correspondent, Shola Shirley, has more. The Speaker of the Ogun State House of Assembly, Olakunle Oluomo, and two other officers of the Assembly arriving in court for their arraignment on an 11-count charge of conspiracy, forgery, and stealing. The other two are the Director of Finance, Oladayo Samuel, and the Clerk of the House, Adeyemo Taiwo. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission alleged, among other things, that it conspired to steal from the Ogun State House of Assembly Treasury the sum of 2,475,000,000 naira. 
charge was filed at the Abiyakuta Division of the Federal High Court. But pending the resumption of courts from the annual vacation, the EFCC arraigned the defendants at the Lagos Division, since it is the designated vacation court to hear all matters from the Southwest jurisdiction. The vacation judge, Justice Daniel Osiago, listened to the defendants take their plea on all the counts. They pleaded not guilty to all 11 counts. The court subsequently considered their bail applications and exercised its discretion in their favor. In granting bail to the speaker, Justice Osiago held that one of his shorties must be not less than a level 16 officer in the civil service, while the other must possess landed property within the court's jurisdiction. The court granted the second and third defendant bail in the sum of 100 million naira each, with two shorties also in like sum. One of their shorties must not be less than a level 14 officer in the civil service, and the other must also possess landed property within the court's jurisdiction. All the shorties are to possess three years tax clearance and swear to an affidavit of means. All defendants are also to deposit their travel documents with the registrar of the court. Pending when they meet their bail conditions, the defendants will be remanded in the custody of the EFCC for a week, after which they will be transferred to the Abelkota Division of the Court for further orders on their remand. Shola Shieli, Channels Television News. To the National Assembly, where the House of Representatives Committee on Finance is calling for the sack of the Director of Finance of the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Council, Mr. Akiobo Ojo, over alleged extra budgetary spending. The chairman of the committee, Mr. James Falike, echoed this at a hearing with the council in Abuja today. Our correspondent Terry Kumi reports. The House of Representatives Committee on Finance continues its interactions with government agencies and ministries to arrive at suitable parameters for the medium-term expenditure framework 2023 to 2025. So far, one thing has been consistent with almost all the agencies, extra budgetary spending. It would seem, however, that a financial statement of the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Council, FCCPC, is the straw that finally breaks the camel's back. We are bleeding. Does it make sense to you that we are borrowing over 11 trillion to fund 2023 budget? And this year alone, you have made over 3 billion, you have spent over 2 billion for no good reason, and you are insisting that you want financial autonomy for your agency. Does it make sense to you, sir? Local training, in the world of 2021, you spent 198. Seven months into the year, you are spending over 266 million naira. If you look at local travel and transport, the same thing. So uh, what we get from this, sir, uh, is that uh, we just see it and create expenditures around this income that we generate. It's even more unfortunate that you're a fully funded agency, you're expected to do 100% remittance, and uh, you just go haywire in terms of your spending. The extra budgetary spending of the agency prompts the committee to call for the sack of the finance director. What happened to the four billion? I'm not asking for your challenge. We use it to augment our uh, overhead cost. Okay, give me your full details, please. Tell me your full details, your name, your name, the dates you joined, the dates you joined your service and your service number, right away, please. Your name. My name is Akio your, your full name, the dates you joined, and your service number. My name is Akio Gbao Josa. My, I joined the service uh, March 13, 2015. 2015? Yes, sir. And then your service number is what? I will provide the committee with my service number. I don't no, I need it now. Okay, sir. We need that service number now. Okay. Because people like you should not be heading any agency. Clark, collect your service number, write a letter I want to personally sign to the Minister of Finance. He must be removed. Write to the Minister of, the Minister of Finance in respect of this agency. And no fund, no fund will be released until we see the letter of the deployment from that agency of this man. Interestingly, the committee observes that the Fiscal Responsibility Act does not prescribe punishment for such actions and calls for an amendment. They further direct the Accountants General to block the account of the FCCPC in the interim. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News.
In part two after the break, Nigeria Customs Service impounds drums of explosive making materials in Ijebuode, Ugu State. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. In what looks like a U-turn, federal government sets up tactical committee to review its no-work, no-pay policy, which has been a stumbling block in its negotiations with ASU. Speaker of the Ogun State House of Assembly, Olakunle Oluomo, pleads not guilty to fraud allegations as federal high court in Lagos grants him bail. Ahead of the 2023 general elections, Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, reviews guidelines for voting in internally displaced persons' camps. And Liz Truss takes over as UK Prime Minister after receiving the Queen's blessing, vows to tackle soaring energy bills. to politics where the Labour Party presidential candidate Peter Obi has been engaging with Nigerians in London this evening as part of a tour that his party chieftains have described as diaspora consultations. Speaking with our London correspondent Juliana Olayinka, Mr Obi denies that the discussions were part of an early campaign strategy but insists that the diaspora is a critical component in turning around the country. There are some observers that have said that the tour that you've embarked upon, which includes visiting the U.S., is starting some sort of campaign. The campaign isn't kicking off until the end of this month. How do you respond to that? It's not campaign, it's consultation. I'm consulting Nigerian diasporans to know why they should be involved in the Nigerian electoral process. It is not campaign. And you can see from my conversation and everything that what I'm doing is saying, well, let's be involved. Well, it's consultation. How important is engaging with the diaspora? They are the most critical component of turning around Nigeria. The, the investment Nigeria needs to turn around its diaspora. If they believe in Nigeria and bring their resources, both in terms of their material, the talent, their energy will turn around the country. There are some suggestions that you've managed to raise a, a whooping 150 million US dollars from your diaspora supporters. Nobody, nobody giving me anything. That is speculation. What I need is not what they will give me, but what they will give Nigeria. Because we need them to turn around Nigeria. This is the energy, this is the capacity that we need to turn around Nigeria. Every country of the world has turned around, was done by their diasporans. Though even in the Bible, it was just said, who left? Would well, rather come back and feed these people? So that's what we're using. We need these people to turn around Nigeria. It's their energy, they have the talent. I don't want to continue sending money home just for welfare. I want that money to turn into investment, which will be beneficial to the people there and beneficial to them. Nigerian 2023 election, should not be based on ethnicity, religion, connection, my thumb, or any bias. It must be on character, competency, capacity, and determination to deal with the problem of Nigeria. Well, so ahead of the 2023 elections, no citizen will be disenfranchised. That's coming from the chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu. The INEC boss announced today that the commission has begun the review of the electoral framework for voters in internally displaced camps, owing to the passage of the 2022 Electoral Act and the introduction of new technologies. Some of the proposals in the draft guidelines include the use of BVAP in IDP camps, which must be configured to polling unit level only. Officials of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, are attending this meeting in Abuja 
with some members of the civil society organizations to present a draft copy of the 2022 election guidelines for voters in internally displaced persons camps. The INEC chairman underscores the imperatives of the new guidelines, citing the 2022 electoral laws and the introduction of additional technologies as key reasons for the review of the previous documents. The idea is to align the framework with the provisions of the Electoral Act 2022, specifically Section 24, Subsection 1, which empowers the Commission to ensure that, as far as practicable, no Nigerian is disenfranchised on account of displacement by emergency situations. The INEC 2015 election guidelines for IDPs limited the definition of internally displaced persons to those affected by insurgency in Adamawa, Borno, and Yobe states. The document was later reviewed in 2019 to include all those displaced by natural disasters. Ahead of the 2023 general elections, the chairman of the INEC Review Committee gives highlights on the draft guidelines for IDP voting. And the voter authentication system, that is smart card reader, was used for voter authentication on election day. While in 2023, the uh, modern voter authentication system givers will be used. It authenticates eligible voters either via the thumbprint or the facial recognition system. Other provisions in the draft guidelines include how the BVAS will be deployed and used, as well as how voting exercises will be conducted in IDP camps. However, some of the representatives of the IDPs here are more interested in their security during the elections. When we started in 2019, many people were saying we can go back to our polling unit and uh, vote if the government provides security enough. But when we look at it, how many polling units in a local world, government or in a world, and how much security do we have in the nation? So it can work that way. But if they are working in bringing this uh, security in where people are residing now, I think the few of them that are brought, they can work. Although the voting population in internally displaced persons camps in Nigeria is unknown, recent data from the United Nations Refugee Agency reveals that there are over 2.1 million IDPs in Nigeria. Two other stories. About 20 drums of calcium carbide have been seized by operatives of the Federal Operations Unit of the Customs Service in the southwest zone along Abirokuta Ijebode axis. The seized illicit product is a controlled substance and one of the major items used in the production of improvised explosive devices, IEDs. Speaking with journalists on the seizure, the acting controller of the unit explains that the importers of the substance are expected to come forward with the necessary document. Carbide is a substance used for the production of IED. If allowed to get into the hands of unscrupulous persons, it could cause very serious security concern. They will join this with other condiments to make explosive. And you cannot just get explosive done without having enough particles and the properties involved. So this one is a critical substance that is used in making IED. And the importation of this has to be approved with an end user certificate from the Office of the National Security Advisor. When it was intercepted, it was neatly packed in a trailer underneath, like first bottom, and it was unraveled. We are waiting for who will come to claim this. Whoever that is coming to claim it must come and give us EUC, end user certificate, and the process through which whether it is imported or is being smuggled, if it is imported and he paid duty, he has to show it to us. But what is critical about this matter is EUC. 
President Mohamed Buhari has signed a memorandum of cooperation on agriculture with Poland to address the food security crisis in the country and Africa in general. This was revealed after a meeting between President Buhari and the Polish President Andrzej Duda, who is on a two-day official visit to Nigeria. The Polish President promised to strengthen economic relations with Nigeria, not only towards addressing food crisis, but energy security. Our State House correspondent, Gloria Mizzou, Okay, reports. President Andrzej Duda is the first Polish head of state to embark on an official visit to Nigeria in the last 60 years. Received by President Mohamed Buhari at the forecourt of the presidential villa, the Polish president, who is on a two-day visit, is warmly welcomed with a 21-gun salute before proceeding into a closed-door meeting. During the strategic meeting between the two leaders, which included dialogue between business leaders of the two countries, food and energy security was central as a memorandum of understanding on agriculture is signed to advance economic cooperation. After the hour-long meeting, President Buhari, who led the Polish president to a joint media conference, acknowledges the existing cooperation with Poland in the areas of defense, agriculture, maritime and education. I wish to see this opportunity to commend the efforts of the government of Poland for the assistance provided to the large number of refugees fleeing the conflict in Ukraine, which included a significant number of Nigerians. Our cooperation in education has a long history and we wish to encourage the extension of this cooperation to the sharing of knowledge and experience between our educational institutions in areas such as science and technology. As regards trade relations, we would like to see an increase in the level of trade as it remains relatively low in spite of the long period of relations between our two countries. In recent years, the Polish president, through an interpreter, states that Poland has taken delivery of LNG gas from Nigeria to Poland and in the aftermath of the Russian war on Ukraine, which he describes as unjustified, Poland would like to ramp up gas supplies from Nigeria. I also want to add that the first supplies of the LNG gas to our LNG gas terminal in Świnoujście from Nigeria have already happened, just like the import of crude oil uh, performed by our oil company Lotos. Uh, those shipments uh, did happen in recent years. And that bids well for the future because we do want to further develop this cooperation. We want to increase the supplies from Nigeria to Poland. And by this uh, way, we also want to contribute to the development of economic relations between both our countries. At a later date, the two leaders indicate plans to further consolidate relations in the areas of defense through an MOU as the Polish president hopes that the conversations will yield speedy and fruitful outcomes as he deepens investment in the country. From the presidential villa, Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. And Gloria isn't done yet. She's got more stories from our Buja studios. Gloria, over to you. Thank you, Millicent. Definitely. Well, here in Abuja, as part of efforts to entrench the development of youths, in addition to promoting national unity, the chairman of the National Governing Board of the National Youth Service Corps, Ambassador Fatima Abubakar, is asking chairman of NYSE State Governing Boards to brace up for improved performance. We're well, speaking in Abuja at a meeting with chairman of State Governing Boards. Ambassador Abubakar says a lot needs to be done to enable the service achieve its mandate and objectives fully. From the 36 states of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory, chairmen of NYSC governing boards converge on Abuja to brainstorm on the future of the scheme. The chairman of the National Governing Board of the Service sets the tone for the meeting as she demands improved performance from the state chairman. Let me not hear 
that while some stakeholders, such as the federal government and a number of states, are functional in the discharge of their obligations to the scheme, the performance of several others leave much to be desired. As they neglect their functions and statutory obligations to the scheme as stipulated in the Act. This may have been born out of the erroneous impression that NYSC is only the federal government's responsibility. For Association of Local Governments of Nigeria and the Federal Capital Territory Administration, it is sad that core members resist posting to local governments, while some organizations still reject core members. Posting at NYSC Congo members is, a, is beginning to be a challenge to everybody, I, I believe. Because we are talking of national service. National service is beyond going to state capitals to serve. If I am not ma making a mistake, no child today, no copper, want to be posted to a local government. One of the challenges of scheme is also the visible declining support of some stakeholders, such as states and local governments, which, adver which adversely impairs the effective performance of the scheme. Many of these stakeholders relegate their roles to the federal government, which is saddled with its enormous responsibilities with the erroneous belief that the NYC is a federal government responsibility. The meeting, which continued behind closed doors, is expected to examine the role of state governing boards in the operations of the NYC in the states, in addition to the welfare and security of core members. Officers and men of the River State Police Command have busted a tried child trafficking ring operating in Alu Ikwere, local government area of Port Harcourt, leading to the rescue of 15 kidnapped children. Well, this was made known in a press conference by the River State Commissioner of Police, Friday Ibuka, at the command's headquarters in Port Harcourt. Also paraded were some suspects involved in various crimes such as armed robbery, kidnapping, car snatching, gun running and drug peddling. Fifteen children rescued by the police in Port Hackett, the River State capital and its environs. The police insists there's a child trafficking ring domiciled in Alu, a query local government area. All the children were found in the custody of a 44-year-old woman who claims to be a reverend sister operating an orphanage home in the city. Police had information about the house in Arlo where some children were being kept by a woman who claims to be a reverend sister. She gave her name, I gave her name as Sister Morin, which he would. Based on the information, we detailed men to go to that place, and she was arrested. The house was searched, and 15 children, ranging from seven years to nine years, were all rescued from the woman's house. She claims to be a member of the Order of Our Lady of Victory Missionary Sisters in England, and that some of the kids in her care are children of people with mental illness. I've been managing. Francisca, Emmanuel, Justice, Chukwe Emeka, Ogadima, they are all my people's uh, children. Then the rest, the, that of uh, Miracle, Queen, Favor, Mad Bosch, are brought to me by one Mr. Victor. Some parents who spoke to Channel's television are relieved to have their children back. On the 19th of April, 2022, I sent my daughter from Shea to go and give some bottles of Prozin by name, Edeze Masi, to my sister. At about 10 a.m. in the morning, reaching 11 o'clock, she had not come, she did not come back. I was in the market when some policemen bring her to the market. When I, I was very happy when I saw her and she was the one. I'm very, very happy. I thank God because the God has done it for me. My son was missing in 2020. 
meeting on the 31st October, being the last Saturday of the month. So I was in the, in the church last Sunday. Sunday. Then uh, my neighbor ran to me and said that my son has been found. Also paraded are other suspects believed to be involved in armed robbery, kidnapping, car snatching, gun running and drug trafficking. The chairman of the House of Representatives on Health Services is calling on the management of the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research to seek alternative ways of raising revenue to augment government's funding of the parastatal. Dr. Tanko Sunonu stated this during an oversight visit to the Nigerian Institute in Lagos today. On his part, the Director General of the NIMR says the achievement of the agency in establishing testing capacity in various parts of the country and vaccine production will further improve health service in the country. We've seen a place whereby infrastructurally it has done better. We've also seen a place where we came when the grant for research that was extracted was just around $200,000. And today we are witnessing an institution in the country that attracted $6.9 million. They have succeeded in, uh, in developing COVID kits. He has also told us that they have done that of uh, uh, hepatitis uh, B virus. They have worked on many different aspects. And we want to see how that can be marketed. And we also have a legal framework to work on that because Nigerian product must be purchased through a local content, which we have also a local content act in the country. So we encourage him to see how he can liaise with government, non-governmental organization, business, uh, uh, and many other stakeholders in the business society so that those can now invest to develop in a very large volume that can be utilized for the country. So far, we've gone quite far in the development. Uh, NIMA is developing um, a subunit COVID-19 vaccines. And then, of course, working with Sokoto for LASA. Uh, Sokoto is developing a DNA vaccine for COVID-19. And um, MVRI is developing mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. And like I said, the uh, University of Georgia will test while NACRIT will provide adjuvant. So, so far, um, I think we've gone more than 60% uh, way on. And we hope that at least one of those uh, three vaccines uh, will be ready for testing to become a candidate by December. Well, that's it from the nation's capital. It's back to you, Millicent. Many thanks, Gloria. And we're back in River State, where the governor, Yesom Wike, says lecturers in state-owned universities did not join the nationwide strike by the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, because they lacked the justification to do so. They said the lecturers in the state enjoy good remuneration, just as the management board of the institutions are adequately funded to provide the needed infrastructure. The governor made the statement during the inauguration of the River State University HA campus in HA local government area. This is the HA campus of the River State University, one of the three satellite campuses flagged up by the Yeson Week administration 12 months ago to decentralize tertiary education and make inroads to the hinterlands to drive development. This campus will serve students in the Faculty of Agriculture of the institution and the governor and company of members of the State Executive Council and others, as well as the school management, are here to inaugurate it. who in February last year presided over the approval of 9 billion naira for the takeoff of the three campuses, helps on the need for better funding of universities to discourage industrial actions. Thank God our university did not join the strike. I thank God that they did not join the strike because there was no basis. There was no basis for them to join the strike. 
Why is that so? You recollect, some time ago, when lecturers were sacked in the university, when the school was shut down by previous administration, I should never want to strike in sympathy of our university. And so I told our university, I'm not here for Father Christmas. If you have your problem, face the government and solve your problem. If any other state has problem, they should solve their own uh, problem. Our students can do suffer because one university somewhere is not being paid. When we had our own problem, nobody came to sympathize with us. Did anybody come? He then inaugurates the project. Besides inaugurating the project, the state government has also flagged up the construction of staff quarters at this campus to be completed in about five months. It's now time for some business news now. Here's Teniola Uyitayo. Thanks a lot, Millicent. Welcome to Business News. The Securities and Exchange Commission says it has recorded a surplus of 2.5 billion naira in the first half of 2022 after three years of deficits. The Director General of SEC, Mr. Lamido Yaguda, made this known today at the 2023-2025 medium-term expenditure framework session with the House of Representatives Committee on Finance. He adds that the Commission had projected an annual deficit of one. 1.6 billion naira for 2022 earlier this year after the COVID-19 pandemic had affected its operations. Also, SEC says it has reduced its workforce by 30% due to the huge personnel cost burden and the move has assisted the commission to boost its profitability. The equities market continues bearish trend as profit taken persists in some banking and consumer goods stocks. Jeffrey Uzono has the details. Welcome to Stock Market Report. Profit taking apparently continued at the NGX today with the market losing 187 billion naira at the close of trade. Another win for the bear. Now, looking at the activity chart, a little over 30% drop was recorded in today's volume while deals and value inch higher. The deals at over 4,000 as against 3,000 yesterday and the value standing at 27 billion naira. The banking counter in the sectoral performance not looking so good today. Looks like investors actually concentrated on Zenith Bank, which shared 75 kobo. GT Code lost 10 kobo and Access Core was down 5 kobo. That's why you see that red there, that number 1.31% in that subsector. Two negative trades successively within the week. Let's see if that sentiment flips tomorrow as buying interest continues. That's it on the Stock Market Report. I'm Jeffrey Uzongo. And that's business news tonight. I'm Teniola Oyitayo. It's back to Millicent for the rest of the news at 10. Thanks, Danny. Let's go outside our shores now, where governments are being implored to make bold moves to rethink food production plans across the African continent. This formed the basis of the ongoing African Green Revolution Forum in Kigali, Rwanda. Under the theme, Grow, Nourish, Reward, Bold Actions for Resilient Food Systems, the summit will explore the action tracks, especially after the 2021 UN Food Systems Summit, where over 30 African national pathways were charted, but which must now be turned into actionable strategies. Our correspondent, Ayola Kassim, has more. With eight years left towards the landmark 2030, when Africa and the rest of the world must achieve the sustainable development goals, notably the eradication of hunger and tackling food insecurity. The reality today shows that more than 282 million people face extreme hunger on the continent. Climate crisis, COVID-19 and conflict in Russia have all combined to push the number up. 
your presence here today. Charging the more than 2,000 participants gathered here in Kigali for this year's African Green Revolution Forum, the Prime Minister of Rwanda says it is time to get back on track to change the negative trend. For this to be achieved, there is a need to build a strong partnership between the public and the private sector for diversified investments that broadly impact agricultural production. Across the continent, steps have already been taken by various stakeholders to deliver the innovations required to drive the food system transformation, but impacts have not been felt. Making these solutions work for everyone is the challenge before these delegates. The strategies and actions we will take from this summit must be resilient because the economic and climate related shocks have revealed that our systems are fragile. Our people need new capacities and innovations and innovation is no longer a luxury. The shocks are becoming an everyday challenge Thus, resilience must be embedded in our strategies and actions. But there is also a case being made for a leadership that would drive the transformation of the food system on the continent. So we need a leadership that is actually backed by evidence, but also a leadership that's flexible to the context that we face today. We know that the crisis that we're facing globally and in the continent is no longer a one-off issue. The Africa Agricultural Status Report, which is an annual publication by the organizers of this forum, was launched at the opening ceremony. It says between 40 and 77 billion dollars in public funds and 180 billion dollars in private funds are needed yearly for the transformation in the sector across the continent. How this will work out is what the delegates here will be talking about within the next three days. From the Kigali Convention Center in Rwanda, Ayola Kassim, China's television news. In Canada, police are searching for the remaining suspect in the Saskatchewan stabbings, Mao Sanderson, after his brother was found dead. There has been a possible sighting of him in James Smith Cree Nation, according to an alert sent to mobile phones of people in the area. Residents are urged to seek immediate shelter. Ten people were stabbed to death Sunday with another 18 injured. Simon Pusey has more on this and other international news and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Canadian police have found the body of one of two brothers wanted for a mass stabbing attack that left 10 people dead and 18 injured in the province of Saskatchewan. An officer said Damien Sanderson, seen here on the left, had injuries that did not appear self-inflicted but gave no further details. He was found at the James Smith Cree Nation, the indigenous community where most of the victims lived. Police say Sanderson's brother, Miles, is still at large and dangerous. Miles Sanderson, Damien's brother, may have sustained injuries. This has not been confirmed. But we do want the public to know this because there is a possibility he may seek medical attention. Even if he is injured, it does not mean he is not still dangerous. Miles has a lengthy criminal record involving both persons and property crimes. Liz Truss has traveled to Scotland to meet the Queen for the transition of power from Boris Johnson to become Prime Minister. Her plane landed earlier in foggy conditions at Aberdeen Airport before a convoy of vehicles took her to Balmoral Castle to meet the Queen. She then addressed the nation from 10 Downing Street. Now is the time to tackle the issues that are holding Britain back. We need to build roads, homes and broadband faster. We need more investment and great jobs in every town and city across our country. We need to reduce the burden on families and help people get on in life. I know that we have what it takes to tackle those challenges. Of course, it won't be easy, but we can do it. We will transform Britain into an aspiration nation with high paying jobs, safe streets and where everyone everywhere has the opportunities they deserve. Earlier, Boris Johnson bowed out as British Prime Minister, ending a tumultuous three years in office.
Mr Johnson, who was forced out of office by his own Conservative Party over a series of scandals, left number 10 Downing Street to choreographed applause from staff and civil servants working there. He then urged the country to come together and back his successor. Liz, trust and this compassionate Conservative government will do everything we can to get people through this crisis and this country will endure it and we will win. And if Putin thinks that he can succeed by blackmailing or bullying the British people, then he is utterly deluded. Footage has been released of Russia's President Vladimir Putin smiling and joking with his defense minister as he inspected a big military drill in Russia's Far East. The Zvezda military news service showed a clip of Putin sitting next to Sergei Shoigu in military combat jackets. The Vostok exercises involved troops from China and India. The defense ministry said the war games that began on September the 1st are made up of 50,000 troops, only a fraction of the 300,000 they said took part in 2018. South Korea has deployed marines and mobilized amphibious vehicles to help with search and rescue efforts after Typhoon Hinamore made landfall in the country's south, leaving thousands of people displaced and at least one person dead. Video showed people being rescued in tanks from waterlogged streets. Casualty numbers could rise as authorities continue rescue operations. About 2,900 people were still waiting to be evacuated, mostly in southern regions. And finally, climate activist Greta Thunberg says Sweden's politicians are ignoring the climate crisis in the run-up to the election on September the 11th. Do we want Thunberg, whose Friday protest outside Sweden's parliament years ago turned into a global youth movement demanding action on climate change, said the issue had been pretty much non-existent during the campaign. We treat the climate crisis as, as a distant threat far away in the future. It's not something that impacts people here and now, but it is very much impacting people here and now. We have chosen not to communicate that some many of the crises that we are experiencing now are very closely interlinked, and therefore people, of course, only focus on the things that, that are right ahead of them instead of actually focusing on the larger holistic picture. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Main thanks, Simon. Now for some sports stories. Here's Vic Timothy's. Thank you, Millicent, and welcome to Sports News. Now, Chelsea this evening made a miserable start to their Champions League campaign as Dinamo Zagreb ruined Pierre Emerick Aubameyang's debut with a 1 0 victory in Group E, while group opponents FC Salzburg and AC Milan played a 1 0 draw. Now, Real Madrid shrugged off the loss of Karim Benzema to an early injury as the holders got their defense of the Champions League off to a winning start with a 3 0 victory at Celtic. Now Erling Haaland maintained his incredible start to life for Manchester City as the Norway strikers double inspired Manchester City to a 4-0 victory at uh, Sevilla and also Kylian Mbappe produced two lethal strikes in the first half finishes as Paris Saint-Germain got their latest bid for Champions League success with a 2-1 victory at the Parc de Prince. Now the World Cup trophy arrived in Senegal earlier today, two months before the competition kicks off in Qatar. Now former French international David Trezeguet unveiled it to the eyes of the Senegalese supporters who came in large numbers to welcome the golden trophy so coveted by the Lions of Teranga. The trophy on a tour of 51 countries is expected to travel to 32 nations that qualified for the 2022 World Cup to be held in Qatar from November the 21st to December the 18th. Senegal will play in Group A alongside hosts Qatar, Ecuador and the Netherlands. In tennis, Norway's Kasper Rod has reached the U.S. Open semi-finals for the first time earlier today with a 6-1, 6-4, 7-6 win over Matteo Berrettini of Italy. The French Open finalist was in rootless form, taking advantage of several unforced errors by his Italian opponent to close out the opening set in 27 minutes. French Open finalist Rod will face either Wimbledon runner-up Nikirios or Karen Kachinov for a place in Sunday's final. Rod will make the number one spot if he wins the U.S. Open title or if he reaches the final and Carlos Alcaraz fails to lift the trophy. 
And that's a wrap on Sports News. I'm Victor Mathias. It's back to Millicent with the wrap of the news at 10. Thanks, Victor. And the main news again. The federal government has agreed to set up a tactical committee to review its no-work, no-pay policy. This followed a meeting between the federal government and representatives of the universities. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Millicent Walker. Have a good night and stay safe.